Hello, Julian. Hello, Mike. Where should we go today? Well, do you fancy going back down under? Great idea. We could chat to Dr. Amber Lee, the exotic specialist from Melbourne in Australia. Let's get her on. Hi, I'm Mike Brampton. And my name is Julian Ho. Welcome to Veterinary Ramblings. Hello. Hello, Amber. Hello, Amber. Amber, how are you? Lovely to meet you. Nice to meet you guys too. Yeah. Really lovely to meet you. So, and, and it's uh, afternoon or evening there now, isn't it? Evening. It is Wednesday evening here. Wow. So you just had a, a busy day at work? I have. Yeah. Yeah? Well, well, we'll be gentle. Have you got a drink? No, I don't. Go and grab yourself a stubby. We'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> you like a drink, Amber. <laughs> Usually I do. I'm I'm all right today though. You sure? Okay. okay. What are you wearing? What's your t-shirt or, or sweater? Is that some rabbits? Bunny oh, rabbits. Bunny yeah. rabbits. Fantastic. Cool. Yeah. Excellent. Because yeah. listeners and viewers may not know who Dr. Amberley is. So just to introduce her, as I'm gonna I'm gonna use the word uh, goddess rather than specialist. Because <laughs> actually I, I've been reading your blog and I think you are nothing less than the specialist goddess of exotic medicine in Australia. Well, and thank you. you. You are one of how many uh, recognised specialists in uh, in avian medicine and surgery? A handful. Many? A handful. So, yeah. Or a wingful. I, yes, a wingful. <laughs> no, that was one of the reasons why I went overseas to do my training was um, because there was just limited opportunities in Australia. So... Um, that was yeah. something that led me to, to go over to the States. So you, you took yourself off lock, stock and barrel from mm. from Melbourne? Yeah. Over to Indianapolis? Yes. And how, how long did you spend, spend over there then? In, in the States in total, nearly a decade. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gosh. Um, and I only just returned home at the end of last year. Right. What, what, what made you go back to Australia? Well... I'm I'm a I'm a big fan of Australia. I, I, the, the whole atmosphere, the everything about it. The I'm a big fan. So I can understand you going back home. Mm. Um, yeah. I can also understand you maybe. Well, no, I won't go there because a lot of our listeners are in America. <laughs> <laughs> they are, but look, I I I haven't been to, to America, but I have been to Australia a couple of times, and I love it. I mean, honestly, is particularly for skiing such a a wonderful um, nightlife there. The glue vine and the and the dancing is brilliant. No, no, no. So, Julie, I, th I think you've talked about Austria. Austria. <laughs> yeah, that, that's Austria. The skiing in Australia isn't great. It, it, it is existent, but it's right. not as good as the rest of the world. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. Uh, that's that's going to make things a bit awkward for the certificate lady. But yeah, no, no, no. You, yeah. Yeah. Aus Aus Australia, Australia. I haven't been yeah. there. No, no, it's a bit too far. My wife didn't go. <laughs> what, what, what took you back then? What, what took you back home? It was a combination of things. Um, you know, missing family and friends was definitely a huge part of it. And then um, with COVID and, and the uncertainty of everything last year, you know, my parents are getting old and my grandparents are elderly. It just felt like the right turn time to move back home. Yeah. yeah so, so, so you moved back home without a job. At, no. At the start of the global <laughs> pandemic. Yeah. No? I've got that wrong, have I? It was, mid, it was through midway through and um, I did have a couple of positions lined up. Right. So I was fortunate that I was able to start work fairly quickly. Yeah. My partner, Ryan, however, really struggled trying to find work. He's an engineer. Oh, right. So, yes, he, he definitely struggled um, in that. A service. mechanical engineer, structural, electronic? Chemical, Chemical yeah. engineer. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Gosh, yeah, yeah it's uh, a tough, uh, tough field actually at the moment, isn't so it? You'd already got stuff lined up then. So, what, what did you? Yeah, like? I was. I was fortunate that I was able to keep in contact with a lot of my colleagues, and so I knew that whatever happened, I'd be able to land on my feet fairly right. soon, and, and hopefully be able to lean on you know my avian and exotic colleagues for you know, part time or casual work until right. something solid uh, occurred. And you're lecturing as well at uh, Melbourne Uni? 
yes, yeah, so I was working casual, um, helping them out with their general practice and exotics department. Um, so, yeah, I've kind of been going through a little bit of a transition at the moment. I'm actually about to accept a full-time position working with a um, exotics practice mm-hmm. um, closer to home and it's a um, the unusual pet vets. So All right. they have a couple of different clinics around Australia. So, so mm-hmm. big, big shout out to the unusual pet vets. Yeah. Cool. So I've really been enjoying working at the clinics that I've been working at, but it's, um, yeah, it's now moved into a full-time position, which is good. Great, great. And, and is that medicine and surgery? Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, I, know, I know one of your great interests is is, um, is in minimally invasive surgery of, uh, of reptiles and birds, isn't it? Yes, yes. Endoscopy and all of those kinds of things. Right. Yeah. Cool. And is there enough work in Australia for that? Uh, I, I don't know what the exotics market's like at all. Yeah, I mean, so we don't have a lot of the exotic species you would see in the UK and the States, but we have all of our native species. So all of our native parrots and reptiles, um, you know, we do have to have licence to keep them as pets, but there's certainly a huge variety of species that we see here too. Mm-hmm. So, do you, what, so hang on, licences to keep. So in Australia... Yes. The- Certain species, uh, you know, maybe more, you know, threatened or endangered, they generally aren't kept as what, you know, wildlife as pets. Mm. Yeah. And then there are others that may be a little bit more difficult to um, take care of and those kind of things. There's special requirements for certain species. Right. So, for example, like a cockatiel, you don't need a licence for, but maybe like a cockatoo, you know, you, you may need a licence. So it just depends on the species and, and the state too, it's a lot of its state regulations. Right. I think I think Australia generally is better at, um, at bio-norming, isn't it? At keeping the uh, the extant fauna and flora as stable as possible. They try to. Well, if you think about it, we're an island, so we're very vulnerable. There's a lot of diseases that we don't have in Australia. We don't have rabies and, and many other diseases. So our um, quarantine and customs are very, very strict about letting animals animal products, plant and, and vegetable material, even into the country. Mm-hmm. Very strict. There's even a TV show about that, isn't there? Yeah, there is. Border, border I Control. Customs. I think, I think it's I've seen it a few times. It's great. I love it. I love yeah. it. It's brilliant, isn't it? Yeah. You, you cannot bring a tin of tuna in here, mate. You can't. No. <laughs> so uh, presumably no one's allowed to keep primates in, uh, in Australia. Right. No, you'd have to have a special license or be a, like a zoo type situation. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, a lot of people do in in the UK, uh, although we're hoping later on this year for a law to be uh, to be brought in uh, disallowing that mm-hmm. because people, a lot of people will keep primates wrongly, badly, terribly, in yeah. fact, without any. Mike, yes, our, our Mike, <laughs> Mike, of course, has a gibbon. This is little Fred. He's pointing to his, his the gibbon hanging from his wall. Um, but that looks happy. It's always it's always happy. It's never doing. Oh, he's always behavior. he's always hanging around. I mean, he's, yeah, he doesn't do much else. You know, he's he's well cared for. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll apply for a license. Yeah. So, what what made you particularly interested in in exotics? In fact, let's let's go even further no, back. Let's find this. it back. I, I, I'm yeah. I'm rather intrigued on this one because we all we all follow our different career paths, don't we? Mm. Yeah. Um, but veterinary medicine is, is is quite unique in, as with other medicines, in that it's it's a vocation, isn't it? It's it's a profession. It's it's a vocation. So let's it's just, no holiday for me. Certainly not. Oh, sorry, but, vocation. But vocation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Clear Aust- ears. Austria. Yeah. 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 Good idea. Clear ears, actually. Australia. Yeah, actually, Australia. for me, um, you know, my passion stemmed from from birds. So I um, got my first pet cockatiel. When I was about eight years old, and um, started raising and, and breeding birds um, from a fairly young age, and just sort of realised that I wanted to work with animals and work with with birds specifically in some capacity. And um, I was fortunate that my uncle was actually a veterinary dentist, and so mm-hmm. you know I would talk with him, and he would say, "Oh, did you know that there's actually avian vets out there? You could be an avian vet." And I was like, "Wow, this is great news. This would be mm-hmm. really." I like science, like problem solving, really like the birds, and was fortunate enough that he was able to set me up 
with work experience um, right. with one of the only avian specialists in the state at that time. This was back when I was in high school. And um, I spent the day with her and I was just like, wow, this is so cool. This is exactly what I want to do. So I kind of already knew before I was even in vet school that was what my end goal was. And so I just really worked hard throughout veterinary school doing externships and placements to really try and work towards that goal. Wow. Mm-hmm. And, and obviously, ultimately, trip over to America, lots of studying. Yeah. Um, living, working, studying in America, and you, you've come back with the qualifications. You are that person. Exactly. Is, yeah. Is it, is it what you expected it to be when you set out on it? No, I don't think you can really anticipate what it's going to be like. Right. Um, it's been a great journey. I've really enjoyed myself. Um, I've learned heaps, and I've been fortunate. I love travel. I've moved around a lot. Um, so being able to combine combine my love of travel as well as my career and, and meeting lots of new people. Fantastic. You know, working overseas, mm. it's been great. So is, is, there, is there a, were you to, you've mentioned this that all started pretty much when you were eight years old. Yeah. So is there anything that you, if you're going to write a letter to your eight-year-old self now, knowing what you know and following the, the life experiences that you've had, fantastic life experiences, what would you actually say? Is there any, is there any guiding tip that you would give your eight-year-old self? I think I would say, um, you know, keep at it, keep at the dream, don't be afraid of failure because there were several times where I was worried that I wouldn't reach my goal, that I wouldn't um, get, you know, high enough marks to get into veterinary school. I wouldn't pass my exams, you know, all those times where I had doubt, you know, I'd go back and say, you you get there in the end, one way or the other, by working hard and, um, you know, don't worry about how long it takes or you know the fear of failure and the doubts that you have that you know eventually it will all work out mm. wow so perseverance you, you wouldn't yeah. say run away do something else <laughs> no i can't think of anything else i'd rather do honestly there's no Good. other job that i think that i would enjoy fantastic and it's, it's not just uh birds is it it's um uh, mammals and reptiles as well small mammals and reptiles yeah, yeah. But the birds are your absolute favourite, aren't they? Yeah, and I think, like, as I kind of went through everything, working with the mammals and the reptiles was like a bonus. I kind of found a love there that I never knew I had kind right. of thing, you mm. know. Um, you know, I love working with rabbits and guinea pigs and I, n- I never owned them, you know, as a kid or anything. The same with, with bearded dragons. They just have the best personalities. So, you know, I'm really glad to have them as my patients now. Mm. I, I'd heard this is years back, Actually, uh, someone said to me, an Australian, oh, we don't keep rabbits in Australia. You know, they're, they're, they're a pest and everyone's told not to keep them. Uh, it's, it, it's state dependent, yeah. Is it? Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. So I'm fortunate the state that I'm in, we are allowed to keep rabbits, but Queensland is a state where rabbits and ferrets are actually illegal. And, and ferrets. And, mm-hmm. and Mike Bramptons. <laughs> yes, yes. Mike has been, Mike is a bandit. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a bush ranger in Queensland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good Wanted man. But 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 you live and work in Melbourne, don't you? Which is yes. seemingly the, the most livable city ever anywhere. Yeah, it has won that award a few times. Yeah. Is that in the world or is that just in Australia? Yeah, it's in the world. It's in yeah. the world. It's worldwide. Wow. Wow, yeah. fantastic. And I can I can speak from experience because I've lived in Sydney, Perth, Canberra, you know, moving around a lot as a kid in my dad's job. And I really, you know, all my family's in Melbourne, so I may be a little bit biased, but it is a really great city. Mm. Not that Perth and Sydney and, and aren't. No, that's yeah, <laughs> very great too, but I think Melbourne has a lot, like culturally, entertainment, sporting, just it kind of has everything. Yeah, mm. and it's it's got more of a temperate climate, hasn't it, than than some of the areas. I mean, um, I've been, I've been up in Cairns, and that is hot. That's hot. That's tropical. Yeah, it is tropical. Um, There's so, only two seasons there: wet and dry. Whereas at Melbourne, you could have four seasons in a day. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, do do you have birds yourself? Do you own any? I do. I do. What, I have crocodiles still. Yeah, crocodiles. Still, still? Still? Yeah. Uh, yeah, my one of my original uh, males, Cloudy. He's nearly twenty-five. Mm-hmm. 
and still really? alive. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So, gosh, and how long do they go on to? Thirty or about thirty is is sort of the upper limit for boys. Yeah. Yeah. So you've been away from Australia for a long time, haven't you? I have been. So I haven't really been in practice in Australia for very long. I kind of practiced initially for about a year, 18 months, and then took off. Right. So there's still a lot about practicing here that um, mm. I still need to learn, I guess. And it's very different to overseas. Yeah. So you're sort of rediscovering the you know what is what is actually happening in the exactly. area that you're working in there. Yeah. yeah. That must be fascinating for you. It Maybe. is. It's really interesting. Yeah, I'm sure it is. How do things compare to uh, to the US? Oh, the diseases we see here are just so different. There's way more infections. Mm-hmm. So things like beak and feather virus are much more prevalent in birds. In certain viruses, um, right, chlamydia right. is much more prevalent. And these are diseases I rarely, if ever, saw in the States. Right. And is that due to husbandry differences or, or just uh, the, the, the climate? So I think like the big feather and the, the chlamydia are just endemic in the wild population mm-hmm. of birds. And a lot of people, because the weather's quite temperate here, keep a lot of their pet parrots outside. So right. that uh, disease transmission uh, is much more readily available between the wildlife and the pets. Right. No, uh, none of your clients treating or uh, keeping bats at the moment. No. <laughs> no, I think, I think the bat are a bit, uh, bit dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that too. Have you guys heard of the Hendra virus? Yes. Yes, we yeah. have indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're not sure how prevalent it is in this country. Okay. Um, we, a few years back, thought there probably wasn't any, but that's because we didn't test for it. Yeah. Interesting. Thing. Yeah, and, and I, I'm I'm not I'm not a, uh, a, a a bat expert by any means. So uh, other than other than the prevalence of lissa viruses in bats, I, I don't really know many of the other viruses. But Hendra viruses we, we have heard about, um, very prevalent in in uh, in lab species, lab capped uh, species. Um, you you wrote an interesting article about care of hedgehogs. Yes. <laughs> and uh, now I always I always find it difficult looking at the photos to tell whether it's a, a hedgehog or, or a hedgehog tenrec because they are very similar, aren't they, in, in looks? Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, tenrecs, I believe you can't keep in Australia, can you? The non indigenous. No, and even species. the African pygmy hedgehogs we can't keep either. Right. But the European mm-hmm. ones you can keep. Yeah, so when I was in the States, the most common species I saw over there were the African pygmy hedgehogs. Right. right. Interesting. And, of course, you can use them for gathering leaves in the winter, can't you, in the autumn, roll them up and scoot them across <laughs> the grass and shake them out afterwards. Um, but I, I read a, a, an awful report, well, I thought it was awful, about New Zealand uh, wanting to eradicate hedgehogs. Have you heard that? I did hear something about that. The hedgehogs are being... Yeah, they have a problem with a lot of introduced species as well because they're such a small island. Mm. Yeah. 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 It seems Uh, slightly ironic, isn't it, because the hedgehogs are in this real stress and mm. and in in the UK. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're we're desperate for more hedgehogs in the UK. Numbers are falling rapidly. Are they on the endangered list yet? Do you know, I'm not sure. Not that that would be a proud, a proud moniker to hang on, on against a, a species, a hedgehog or, mm. or hedge pigs. One of the a lot of a lot Urchins. of relate. Yeah, well, they they relate to those, don't they? But, um, as as a typical part of the English countryside. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah they're, they're definitely under threat. It's rather yeah. ironic we can't bring them over, bring them back. Yeah, we we took them it's over there. Good. Now we, we'll bring them back again. So I think they were, they were taken over initially because the the Europeans settling in New Zealand wanted them there. They wanted to make it a bit more like Europe, a bit more like England. So they yeah. they took them yeah, over they with them. Same in Australia too, with the rabbits and foxes. Mm, yeah, that was a bad idea, wasn't it? Mm. Uh, yeah. But but the Australians gave us myxomatosis back, sort of quid pro quo. So I guess we were even Stevens there, weren't we, on that? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> do, do you have the surname Warren or Warrener in Australia? Is that a common surname? Warren is, yeah, Warren. I've come across people with that surname. Because that, that was a, a middle, uh, middle-aged middle name, I believe, surname for someone who was in charge of, of rabbits. Yeah. So... Go on. Hmm. Oh. Yeah. Warren or Warrener. Right. Just tell, yeah. tell me more. Um, that's it, really. Uh, rabbits were, were introduced twice to the UK. They were introduced, uh, firstly, by the Romans as, as food. They were particularly keen on, on eating rabbit fetuses. Because uh, why, why wouldn't you? Uh, and I think they, they, they were all but wiped out towards the 3rd or 4th century AD, but then reintroduced in the, in the Middle Ages uh, as, um, as, as a, a hunting food. And so they were kept very, very tightly controlled initially in these in these huge warrens by the warreners, right? Uh, who then would um, would chase them out and release them for for hounds to chase after and for uh, archers to, uh, to 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 shoot. Um, but of course, rabbits being what they are, they they bred like well, like right. themselves, and mm-hmm. um, and escaped a lot. But the, so the name Warren or Warren is, I think, a middle, middle-aged uh, term for, for uh, people who used to look after them. So I guess the, the Warrens coming over to Australia are also an introduced species. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going somewhere with that. <laughs> I was, it's, it all, all a long set-up, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it was quite painful. Yeah, the, 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 well, hopefully that's today's joke done. No, no, no. I'm afraid there's an even worse thing for the joke. It's, it's no good. Uh, I, I usually finish up on a joke, Amber. It's, it's never a good one. Sorry. Just <laughs> forewarning you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, have a, we have a big problem with badgers in, uh, in England, in the UK, yeah. I should say, uh, in that there are, there are becoming rapidly fewer and fewer of them because the... Um, uh, the government have decided that that uh, they spread TB uh, mm. and uh, and trying to destroy them all, and so we were hoping to send a couple of thousand over to Australia to sort of keep safe. <laughs> we, is that I, what, what what address can we put on the on the container? <laughs> you can try. Yeah, you can try. I don't know if you'll get them through customs or. <laughs> oh, oh, go on. Go on. We oh, seal it up real well. We'll mention your name. We we know Amber. Yeah. 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 No, we, we need somebody to safe keep all things. It's, uh... yeah, we do. We do. How, how, are, how are animals doing generally after the after the awful fires you had for the last couple of years? Struggling. Yeah. Mm. Um, you know, there's a lot of recovery efforts going on, but um, there were thousands of lives lost after the bushfires last year. It's quite sad and devastating. Mm. And yeah. how are the vets doing as well? I mean, there must be huge amounts of stress just trying to look after all those poor injured animals. It was, yeah, it was pretty tough for a lot of vets last year. And, um, you know, you sort of had the bushfires in February, January, February, and then COVID hit a month later and it was just kind of knocked everyone, you know. Um, the, my mm. colleagues here in, in Melbourne went through two or three lockdowns and, you know, spent most of the year not able to travel more than five kilometres from their house. So I know when I got back at the end of last year, they were just, like, struggling and, and really, you know, as you guys know, the, the caseload has just increased for everyone during mm. COVID and mm. just trying to keep up with that demand and, but you know, being understaffed and, you know, having um, being burnt out from from working all that time. Yeah, it, it is, and, and I'm I'm aware that, that this this part of the talk is getting a little little depressing, a little low. But but actually, it's a very real part of of our lives, isn't it? People's lives generally. Uh, I'm not going to single out vets uh, as having a, a harder time as, as anyone else because because we're not, of course. Um, but. I, I think at this time when we are under so much stress, it's all more important to, to take care of your of your mental health, isn't it? And I believe that's very close to your heart as well. Yeah. Do, do, do you want to tell us a bit about about your your mind? Is it mindfulness, isn't it? That you're yeah uh, into? yeah. So you know, I think 
you know, within our profession, we're all acutely aware of how much we struggle and how high the suicide suicide rate is for veterinary professionals. And, um, you know, I'm glad that a lot of my colleagues are talking up now and raising awareness. There are a lot of groups, support groups online, even charities and things like that that are just trying to, you know, reduce the stigma of mental health issues, especially within our profession. And myself, I've been through periods of depression and anxiety when, you know, work has been hard or study has been hard. And, um, yeah, I, I, you know, found taking care of ourselves is really important so that we can then take care of our patients. It, it just takes one off comment, doesn't it, or one mm. angry client who just lets go and it just triggers that whole cascade of, of negativity and, and self-doubt um, mm. in your mind, doesn't it? You, you, never, you don't think of the, the hundred previous clients who, who praised you to the hilt because of the amazing work you've done. It comes down to that one, just that one comment and that triggers the whole thing. Is, is that yeah. is that in your experience as well, Amber? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, especially in the States where um, it's such a litigious society, there's that threat of being sued or just, you know, having a negative review on Google or social media could just be so damaging to that, that vet or their practice. Yeah. So, yeah. I was going to say, some people uh, who, who say negative things don't mean it. They'll have had a bad day, they'll have had a parking ticket, that they'll be crotchety for some reason, and, and they'll snap. And it's all about uh, us trying to be careful about what we say to other people, always having that little bit of sensitivity, isn't it, to think, well, actually, am I really annoyed at this person? If I am, well, there are channels to go through to say what my concerns are. Mm-hmm. Uh, or am I just picking on them to try and ease off a burden of of stress somewhere else yeah yeah Yeah. and at the same time like we don't know what clients are going through you know and trying to approach them with kindness because Mm. everyone's situation is different and again like the whole the whole past 12 months that we've all been going through it's just unprecedented we just you know no don't know what's going on in that person's life yeah we don't we don't i heard a great description of of uh of stress definition of stress the other day that um it's, it's always some we know what stress is we know when we are stressed but um it, it's difficult trying to explain exactly what stress is and this i think nailed it uh it said stress is the conflict evoked in your brain when you're unable to choke the living crap out of something that's annoying you and i think that <laughs> that, that really that really says it all doesn't it well, we, we, we internalise it, don't we? Mm. Yeah. And, um, and that's not necessarily the best thing to do. And we all smile. No. I think I'd, li- I'd like to backtrack on something you said there, Amber, because you, mm. you mentioned that, um, and I think it's worthwhile mentioning this. I make no apology for doing so. You, you talk about the suicide rate of vets, and a lot of our listeners are not vets. Um, a lot of our listeners are members of the general public who have an interest in animals and, and veterinary science. And I think it's worth actually putting a number on that. And I've, I've read statistics recently that say that a vet is three to four times more likely to commit suicide than any other profession. And that includes the stressful professions such as doctors, nurses, airline pilots, the works. And um, so it's, it's, something to, it's something to be aware of, I think, definitely, because uh, that's incredibly high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think we, we probably all have colleagues that we know that we've that we've lost. Yeah, we we, we yeah. do, and and colleagues uh, that we're worried about. Exactly. Well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think keeping mindfulness for yourself, you, you mentioned, very very important, and keeping an eye out for for others, and not being afraid to say, "Are you all right?" Not being afraid of of, of starting that that conversation and saying, "Do you know?" I'm a little worried about you. I, tell me, tell me if I'm wrong, but you just seem to be a little bit off the last few days. Yeah. You, do you want to chat? If you can chat now, great. If if you want me to give you a buzz later or go out for coffee or something, and it, it's starting, isn't it? That conversation. Yeah. Uh, that, that could could be nothing. It could be them saying, "Do you know? Absolutely fine. No problem at all." 
or it could be then saying, well, actually, do, do you mind? Do you mind just having a little chat? Well, I, I, I did that with a colleague on, on Sunday at work. And um, I said, you know, are you okay? And I went, no, you're treading on my foot and you've stuck a needle in there. <laughs> Get off. <laughs> You're, you're such a comfort, Mike. I was, I was just trying to be helpful. That was all. <laughs> uh, no worries at all. Yeah, such is life. So, so tell, tell me, Amber, you, 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 you have admitted to having listened to or seen previous episodes of Veterinary Ramblings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had to do my research before coming on here. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> and you still yeah. came. <laughs> you fool. You fool. You. <laughs> <laughs> I do not know. Okay, so in that case, then, have you come across what we call sixty-second CPD? Yes, yes, I have. You have. Oh, yes. Oh, have you? Do, you have do you, one for us. Would you do one? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Fantastic. What do you fancy doing? Oh, I better get the clock ready. What, what do you fancy doing? Yeah, well, since we were talking about mindfulness, I wanted to talk, touch a little bit on that and some of the things that have helped me along my uh, journey. Yeah, okay. That's uh, Well, that, that's really good. Yeah, I like that. Um, let me see. Right, I've got... Right, I've got, the, I've got the clock here. Hang on. Here we go. Here is the clock. Okay, so, so you want to share with us some mindfulness or, or is, it, is it coping strategies? What... Yeah, so I'll just explain like what mindfulness is and okay. some of the coping strategies that I've used. Okay, that's fantastic. Great. All right, fantastic. So, so Amber Lee, um, specialist avian and exotic vet from Australia, Melbourne, Australia, you have 60 seconds on mindfulness starting now. Okay, so mindfulness is the idea of learning how to be fully present and engaged in the moment being aware of your thoughts and feelings without distraction or judgment. And a few years ago, I found mindfulness at a time when I was struggling with burnout, compassion fatigue, and had increasing anxiety. So I made some changes with my daily routine with the use of meditation apps. These were guided and I liked that they had different options for different situations. For example, if I was feeling stressed or if I was having trouble sleeping, and I found that these practices gave me the tools to help me understand my thoughts and feelings and accept them without judging myself. Other things that really helped were uh, a pillow spray, which is like a calming scent, or listening to white noise or sleep stories before going to bed. And this has developed into a routine uh, every evening where I turn off my electronics an hour before I go to bed and start winding down for the night. Wow. Well, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. amazing. Thank you. You're welcome. So much. Brilliant. That was. That, that's encapsulated, I think, the whole of mindfulness. Yeah. In 60 seconds. Absolutely. Um, it's interesting. We, mindfulness is a term that's banded around quite a lot. Yeah. If, if you were I've to say to someone. I've just learned a hell of a lot about it. Yeah. Um, I must admit, when someone says mindfulness, or I, I tend to think of things that calm you. That's, mm -hmm. that's my thought or you know what what is mindfulness but actually you, you got it well that is being in the moment and being able to yeah. focus on yeah. and enjoy what, what you're doing i think that was what you said that's what struck me i mean th this I've, I've you've just made me realize amber that i've been paying lip service to mindfulness and and being a gentleman of a certain age i think i've probably put it down to a little bit of hoodoo woodoo voodoo modern age woke that's uh, right got to put your linen clothes on before you get into mindfulness yeah 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 well, just just pull your braces up tighten your belt and get on with it you know typical probably a typical australian outbacker to be honest i should probably be on <laughs> on the uh, outback um what, what's the uh gold mining or or something yeah, like that. yeah. <laughs> probably one of those one of those characters of one of those shows or the, the outback mm. truckers or or yeah. something like that <laughs> but you've, you've just you've just triggered something there and and it's so you, would you explain more about this for me I, i'm sure all yeah. of our listeners are going oh mike for goodness sake we all know all of this <laughs> but mike doesn't know this and i'd like uh, no, nor does nor does julian I I, 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 it's yeah. self-indulgent here can we dive yeah. into this and and talk to us about about this being in the moment and this 
the, the other thing that struck me there was sort of accepting, ac accepting it without that was the big thing for me that I realised too was like I was letting myself get over emotional. I was overreacting to certain situations right. and I wasn't really dealing with my emotions. Maybe I was suppressing or internalising them, but by doing these exercises and, and other things too, like I talked about earlier, getting enough sleep, eating mm -hmm. well, exercising, I did start talking with a therapist as well. Mm -hmm. But sort of the combination of doing all these things um, really kind of helped me change my perspective and you know these are tools that I still use every day now um, you know several years later but the um, the mindfulness there's lots of different apps available and that's how I sort of d delved into it was you know I, I think maybe I heard about it online and watched a couple of um, online webinars through Vin on meditation and thought this is really interesting um, you know, you go into it and you're thinking you're going to just be clearing your mind, but it's it's not. It's, it's You're actually sort of focusing your thoughts a bit more and sitting with them a little bit, and that can be uncomfortable for some people and other people find it hard to stay on track and they go, this is too boring, my mind is racing, I can't just kind of sit with myself. And so for those people that maybe have tried meditation and thought, oh, it's not for me, it may be better to start with shorter time frames, maybe a few minutes at a time and, and practice that for a while before you build up to doing like a half an hour meditation or an hour meditation. But I find that, um, you know, I can, I can do that at, at various points during my day. If I'm having a stressful day, maybe I'm sitting down at my desk about to eat my lunch and I'll just take a few minutes to sit and think about things or, you know, before I'm getting ready to go to bed, I might listen to a sleep story and that helps kind of relax me and get me in the mood so that I can kind of switch off all those heavy thoughts that are in my head, mm -hmm. you know, things that I was, th was thinking about at work that are sort of still niggling in my brain that I want to sort of switch that off and, and move on and just um, be able to get restful sleep. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. I wake up three o'clock in the morning sometimes and I, I describe it as brain fire. And it's like somebody has just lit firework inside my brain. And I'll be thinking about all sorts of stuff, anesthesia, designs, electronics, um, stressful situations at work, um, things that have happened during the day. Sometimes it will be something exciting that's happening the next day. But they're ideas and it will be stuff that I want to write. Stuff I don't. And I, I'm, I'm strugg I struggle with it. The only the only thing I found helps now is if I actually take a pencil and paper and, mm -hmm. and actually start writing stuff out. And so, mm -hmm. because if I manage to get back to sleep, these ideas, it's not negative. A lot of it is positive stuff. You know, I need to do this. So if I try tweaking that, will that happen? Etc. Etc. Mm -hmm. rather than the negative thing. They're generally positive ideas. If I don't write them down, I've forgotten them by the morning. If I get back to sleep again, and then I get frustrated. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's interesting. I, I have a notebook sometimes, um, uh, but by my bed. But what I what I do is I, I pre-write positive things in it because I'm, I'm a sleep warrior. I wake up at you know, two or three in the morning, and I think, okay, I've woken up. That's all right. I can go back to sleep again as long as I don't think about what Mrs. Goggins said. Oh, no, I thought about that. Oh, what do I do? What do I do? Oh, my God. Oh, no, no, no. So I, I, if I remember, if I'm waking up, I, I look at this little book. It's got some positive things that perhaps people said to me that day or, or the previous week. All right. Uh, and and that, that helps as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's something I've done at, at one point too, where I've just written down like five, ten things, good things that have happened to me, whether it's with a patient or an interaction with a client. And like stuck them on my fridge so that when I walk past it, I see and remind myself, you know, yes, there are times where work is difficult, but the, the positives and the, the good times are why we're there and why we do it. Mm. Have you have you looked at neurolinguistic programming at all? Because some of this is is suggesting very similar things in that we we reframe in our minds. Mm -hmm what a certain stimulus or what certain words mean to us. Is, is that stuff that you've looked at as well? I haven't looked into it in detail, but I know what you're talking about because mm. a lot of the, the guided meditations that I've done um, 
kind of get you to do that when you're doing the process of, of, of listening to the, the meditation. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, you might be, you know, I used to sort of catastrophize things, you know, and blow things out of proportion. And I found that by being able to be mindful and, you know, present in the moment or focus on my breathing, I'm able to kind of de-escalate stressful situations. I think that's what you're talking about, right? Yeah, it, it, um, the, it, it came to me. I, I used to um, race bicycles a lot. And the, the bicycles would always win. Yeah, the bicycles would always win. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, I, was, I was struggling. I, would, I was a sprinter and was struggling. Um, I had a few bad accidents and was struggling to put myself in positions to enable myself to win and it yeah. started preying on my mind and um, the guys at British Cycling were very very helpful to me in that they rephrased what it was that I was going through and so when I felt my body reacting in a certain way I was able to rephrase it not that what am I doing here why am I here I should get out of this dangerous situation but my body is now telling me I'm ready for this bring it on um it led to some a couple of horrendous accidents but that's another, that's another story <laughs> it was probably too successful in the, the danger side was was switched off almost completely but um that and that i think was was more neuro-linguistic programming than the mindfulness in that regard but uh, so is there a particular routine is are there any resources that we could take our listeners to to um there's, there's heaps so um, I just did a, a Google search earlier today. You just Google mindfulness and meditation um, right. in veterinary medicine and, you know, veterinary practice, DVM 360 have all written articles about it. Mm-hmm. You know, personally what's worked for me are different apps, so things like Buddhify, um, which is a great one. I think it's free still. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the others you have to subscribe or you can do like a 30-day trial period. So mm-hmm. Headspace I've used and Calm. They're sort of the premium apps um, that you do have to subscribe for a year. Right. But they, they do offer a lot. So if you're someone that's just learning or wanting to try, they're a good option. You could just cancel it if it's not working for you. But they have a lot of introductory meditations. And um, like I said, a lot of it's situational based. So are you feeling stressed? Are you feeling uh, tired? You know, are you going for a walk? Do you want to just sort of, you know, do some meditation while you're out? in the park you know they've really got a lot of different um ideas and ways to incorporate it into your day and um i really liked the the calm app because they've got sleep stories i found those are really good nice sort of relaxing things to listen to before you go to sleep what i've used that it's great stories what are sleep stories yeah so it's just different people um sometimes they're famous people sometimes they're just people with nice voices and they'll just read a story to you it's kind of like being a kid again and having someone read you a bedtime mm. story. I like and they're, they're really great stories too. Like my favourite ones are the train ones, like going on a train journey somewhere, you know, going on the Orient Express or going on the, the Highland, you know, the Scottish Highland train or, yeah, I really but, like them. But not murder on there. the Orient Express. That would be getting a different sort of <laughs> yeah. vibe, wouldn't they? <laughs> But yeah, they just have all different ones, and they even have ones for for kids as well. Um, but they've tried to aim that for you know different ages, which is good, right. I guess. Mm. So do you ever, do you ever do you fall asleep before the end of the story? Yeah, most of the time I do. Yeah, <laughs> you don't wake up thinking, "Oh, how did it end?" Did they yeah, end? I'm like half these stories, I I don't know the ending to them. <laughs> who, who was the murderer? Oh, no, we, we, sorry, we wouldn't do that one. You know, I, I got a I got a new app. I, I, I feel I must tell you all about it um, because I'm I'm doing a uh, a mental health first aid course at the moment uh, over the last three weeks or the last uh, last session tomorrow, uh, which uh, my my company has arranged for uh, for a few of us to do. I think it's it's fantastic. It's very good, but they suggested an app and it's called Stay Alive. It's a free app. Uh, I can't see it. I can't really see it. There we go. But it's this one here. All right. Okay. So stay alive. 
got a message come in there on you're showing your phone to the screen there, Julian. And I think I know I've got a, I've got a scanning that, message from you, Barclays. You've got a message saying so, that you're overdrawn at your Barclays bank account. Come up on well, this. The is, yep, this is from Barclays saying we need to make sure your personal contact details for your business banking account are up to date. All right. uh, now, I, I haven't got a business uh, banking account with Barclays, right. so um, people, if you're getting these messages, just check. Okay, if you if you then press on the number, uh, it's not giving Barclays; it's giving some random uh, mobile number. So I bet, it, I bet it looks like Barclays. It looks like Barclays, yeah. but it's not. That's the thing. But this, so there's this program, uh, staying alive, and it it asks you when you go onto it. It says, uh, which of the following best describes you? I'm using stay alive for myself, for someone else, or for learning more. And it'll then take you through, uh, if you go on to myself, it'll take you through some mindless exercises or, or give you resources, online resources, who to go, who to see, who to speak to. If it's for someone else, uh, it'll talk about something called the algae approach, the approach and listen, give advice, encourage approach. Um, and learning more, again, it'll give you a bit of information, further resources, people to speak to. Um, it's free, it's great. Uh, and it's all about trying to to get people to open up if they've got a problem because you mentioned about the stigma of mental health we, we, we've all had and all will have mental health problems at some stage whether that's for for those blessed few uh just the the, the stress of not doing whether a deal's coming off mm -hmm. uh and, and for the majority of us uh more more and more stresses of daily life and it's very important just to be aware that everyone has these stresses and it's okay to mention that you have them and it's okay to, to really struggle with them because mm -hmm. there are people who can help and that there is always someone who can help yeah. and there is always something that can be done and there is always a good end to these things mm -hmm. so there we go enough said for me <laughs> It's all very heavy there, isn't it? I'm, I'm, not normally, here. I'm not normally heavy like that. I'm normally grumpy like this fellow on the right here. And I'm talking about Mike. I'm talking about the colobus monkey. <laughs> Mike, <laughs> Mike's never grumpy. Oh, there he is. <laughs> yeah, you sometimes remember that. Yeah. <laughs> right. I've got a joke. Should I tell you a joke to lighten things up? Yeah, go on then. Tell us, let's get the joke out of the way. We'll get the joke out of the way first, and then we'll do the CPD certificate. Oh, go on then. Go on. So, so here we go. Uh, I quite like this joke. Uh, I was trying to look you like for a all joke. the jokes. You <laughs> always <laughs> like. I was, I was giggling when right there. Does. So, uh, this is this is what I heard a long time ago. So, I may I may struggle to remember it. And it also may not be relevant now because um, uh, because no one goes into record shops anymore. But this is about the world's leading wasp expert, and he goes into. Do you have HMV in? Um, in Australia. Yeah. Okay, so he goes into an HMB store and he says, um, so I understand that the new European Vesperity uh, Acoustics album, Volume 2, uh, has come out. Uh, do, do, you, do you stock it? I think we do, actually, yes. Yes, we've got a copy. I, you know, then we're going to sell it. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll buy it. Can I listen to it first? He says, yes, certainly I'll, I'll put it on the, uh, the turntable for you. So oh, fantastic, absolutely brilliant, wonderful. And it goes on to track one, and there's this. He uh, says, I, I don't know that one. That's all. I've never heard of that one. Try, try another track. So he lifts the needle up. And uh, sorry, young people may not know what a needle is and what a record is. So it's an old gramophone <laughs> player. So it's like a CD, but rather than having a laser to read it, there's a little needle that reads and, and, anyway, anyway, anyway. And back back in the day, back in the day, you'd go to a record shop and you could actually say, oh, I'd like to listen to this piece of vinyl. Here. Yes. And you'd go to a booth or, or yeah. a headphone <laughs> place at the back of the shop and actually be allowed to listen to said record before you purchased it. It's so anyway, another way that you do it because you're, you're ripping off on your mobile phone. Yeah, but anyway, so, come on. So, so he lifts the needle up and goes on to another track. And says, no, he says, I think I don't recognize that at all. Are you sure you've got the right album here? He says, uh, Yeah, European Vesperity Acoustics Volume 2. Try another one, try another one. 
Uh, no, he says, no, no, I'm sorry, I'm not having this. This is, this is wrong. They, they've, they've got some errors on this. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I will not buy it. It's awful, it's terrible. And the shop assistant's looking, he said, I'm terribly sorry, it's my fault. He said, it was on the B side. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. <laughs> B side, yeah. Okay. Uh, I like that one. Yeah. I've got a certificate, but we'll move rapidly on. Go on then. So here is here is the CPD certificate. What we got? And here? it says, it says here we go, it says certificate of serenity. It okay. certifies that being calm and mindful is the best way to be. And it says at the bottom, om money part me hum. And uh, after explaining the, the pictures, it, this is one of my favourites. This is a cat sitting on a bunch of towels. I barely see that, Julian. I know, and I have to try and fit quite a lot on it. There's a cat sitting on a bunch of towels doing some yoga. Right. Uh, there's also a nice picture of the, the mountains of, of, of Austria. Um, right. <laughs> sorry about that, Amber. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, there we go. Now, this uh, is, is a, a table set for Christmas dinner. And the reason I've got this on is that it's my aunt's, aunt and uncle's cottage, which is just down the road at a place called Amberley. And I Aww. thought, well, there we go. We've got Amber Lee on. This is Amberley. <laughs> and I didn't have a picture of you to put on it, so I've got a picture of Amberley. So there's that. And there's, there's a wallaby. Now, wallabies are animals that want to be kangaroos. Um, and there's also a, a, a picture of, of Ganesha who is, of course, one of the uh, Buddhist uh, satisvas, I believe. I'm out of my depth here on, on the knowledge of Buddhism. But, is it um, Buddhist or Hindu? Oh, oh, it's Hindu. Oh, it's Hindu, isn't it? There you go. So it's completely wrong. It's, as I said, I'm out of my depth on that. But I, I quite like it anyway. So I'm keeping it on there. And there's some birds. There's an owl and there's a red bird and there's another another red bird. Oh no, that, that red bird there's a chicken. Chicken. Uh, wrapped in, um, not completely wrapped, but wrapped in bubble wrap because it's just coming around from, from surgery. I had an egg bound chicken uh, that had a, a, a ruptured egg in the in the oviduct. So I operated on it and we're keeping it warm with a bit of, uh, bit of bubble wrap around that. And what you can't see, unfortunately, is the, uh, the bubble wrap has a uh, keep in fridge best before on it. <laughs> so, <laughs> and perhaps, perhaps we should say also just just pick up on that particular point that bubble wrap is incredibly good at keeping patients who will be susceptible to getting cold mm. warm. Very easy. Very, mm, very good. Yeah, yeah mm. absolutely. So, you know, if you if you if you go to your veterinary practice and you found that your hamster is wrapped up in bubble wrap. It's not that they're preparing it for its journey home. Um, it's that they're trying to keep it warm <laughs> so that it can recover from its anaesthetic a lot quicker. Um, very easy to do. Absolutely. You can also use it to wrap around your stubby bottles, keep them warm for the, warm for the barley, a cold rather for the barley. Well, it's just an insulator, isn't it? It is. It is. Yeah. If your beer is cold to start with, wrap it up in bubble wrap and it'll stay cooler for longer. Mm -hmm. if, if your soup is warm to start with, Wrap that up in bubble wrap and it'll stay warmer for longer. Yeah. Although I have one of those flasks, you know, when what, a uh, vacuum flask. A vacuum flask. And yeah. it, it said on the uh, on the box, it said keeps hot food hot and cold food cold. Yeah. Well, I took it back because so my ice cream melted into my soup. It's rubbish. <laughs> it all tasted awful and looked like a real mess. I've been looking forward to it for an hour and it was, it was rotten, really. Got my money back on that one. Yeah, never mind. You can't, you can't, you can't pick and choose, can you, Amber? I mean, it's <laughs> it is what it is. I don't know. I was, I was sure you were going to. I know I was going to be the butt of some Australian joke that you had planned. We would never, ever be culturist. <laughs> like that. Did, were you looking forward to that then? <laughs> I was expecting. I was fully expecting it. <laughs> Oh my word! What 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 reputation has preceded us, Julian? I don't know. Is this? Are, are we, we 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 do? I don't know. Well, I feel like there's this little bit of a rivalry between the British and the Australians, and that you know, 
I wasn't. I wouldn't have been surprised if you had a. Uh, no, there's no. Ri- we're right. giving you a couple of years to catch up. Then we'll start the rivalry. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite simple. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> we never, we never kick them while they're down. That's the thing, Amber. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I think um, whilst it whilst it might be humorous for us, some people might not not like it. You know, I mean, so. Uh, so let's think of a non-PC question I could ask you. Um, I've got one. Having having already proclaimed myself a bush ranger in in uh, Queensland, so how far back can you trace your lineage to Australia, then, Amber? What took your family to Australia in the first place? Um, well, which crime? Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's precisely correct. <laughs> Is it really? You- For a lot of us, yes. Um, I'm just trying to think. My mum's actually really into genealogy and she's on the ancestry doing our family trees at the moment, actually. Oh, right. I'm not exactly sure how far back she's gotten, but her family are from Cornwall. Right. Oh. Uh, they came over, I think, in the early 1800s. Wow. Early to mid- Okay. Mm-hmm. Gosh. In terms have of, you ever been to Cornwall? Have you been over here? No, no, I've only been to London. Right. Well, Cornwall's That's a lovely. bit like Cornwall. <laughs> <laughs> There's still pasties there. <laughs> G- G- Ginsters pasties. Yeah, no, you don't want to be doing that. Uh, other, but, other, other types of pasty are available, but thank heavens. No, Ginsters are fine. In that case, I think we should say thank you very much because you've been an absolutely amazing guest. It's been really lovely talking to you Indeed. and uh, hearing all about, um, about mindfulness and about how wonderful Melbourne is. Can't wait to get out there. Absolutely. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. No, it's, it's good. I'm, yeah, you, you, you sort of you've got my mind tweaking here. So uh, it's on to Google for me Ooh. now and see what we oh, find on this stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's always dangerous, isn't it, Julian? <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely brilliant. So, so I suppose all it beholds us to do is, if you've enjoyed listening to Amber as much as we have, then don't forget to subscribe, click like, share it with your friends. We've, we've covered some interesting stuff here on this episode, and there's loads more to come. If there's any subjects you'd like us to cover in the future, drop us a line, get in touch, and we'll do what we can to accommodate. So... Uh, Amber Lee, all the way from Australia, with the wonders of modern technology, talking live to us. Thank you very, very much indeed for joining us on Petri Ramblings. May your dog you go. Me. May your dog go with you. May your dog go with you. Take care. <laughs> and cut. There we go. <laughs> yeah, brilliant, Amber. Thank you ever so much. That was amazing. Glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, it was fun. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's good. Good. You're very well. Well, thank you for sharing, you know, moments of your life with with us in the audience. I think that um, helps bring the bring a podcast to life a little bit if we can if we can delve into those sorts of things. But Amber, look, thanks so much again. Yeah. Really, it's been lovely. So, thank you so much. You're you welcome, thank you guys. I'm going to look and into hope... these apps and things. Yeah, yeah, thank you. yeah. really, really useful uh, advice you've given. Yeah. Uh, I hope one day I'll come over to Australia, and I hope we can uh, meet up. And Absolutely. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks. I enjoyed it. You take Thanks, care. Guys. You take care. Take care. Bye bye. Bye.